Oh, there's no single leg attempt from Gaziev. There we go. Yeah, Gaziev gets him down. He's in half guard now. He's in half guard now. He's got Rosen Strike down. There we go. Here we go. Rosen Strike's done. Rosen Strike's done. He's gonna gas out after being on his back. Jarzino Rosen Strike just sunned Shamil the Blob Gaziev by decision. And this was a weird one because, guys, I, I understand that I may have not made my best prediction. I did pick Shamil. And um, it's not a good one. It definitely isn't a good one. I was underprepared in this main event. I will admit that. I did not do enough preparation for this one. I did not look into the weeds as much as I should have in Shamil's record because one thing that I found out very early in this fight was that Shamil Gaziev doesn't know how to wrestle. And even though he took down Jarzinho Rosenstrike early, and I got very hyped. I was insanely hyped. I was saying, okay, here we go. He's got his first takedown. The first one's the hardest one to get. After this, it's going to be easy. But then he just got jabbed up. But again, it's like, Shamil doesn't know how to wrestle. People are talking about his cardio. Yeah, his cardio doesn't look good. But at the same time, like, what was he doing in the second, third, fourth, and fifth? Shamil Ghaziev just stood there, menacingly grinning at Rosenstrike, with his mouthpiece bobbling around his mouth, jiggling around the octagon, moving one inch every single five minutes, and that was it. Like, it was an absolute disaster. And when I say I was unprepared for this one, I really mean it. Like, as soon as Shamil walked out, they were talking about how he used to play volleyball, and he was on, you know, the, the all Bahrainian volleyball team, and I started to get worried when I heard that because I was like, damn, I thought this guy would have been wrestling back in the day. You know, I, I was thinking, dude, this guy grew up in Dagestan, wrestling, shooting one, two, shooting takedowns. And the next thing you know, I find out he's a fucking volleyball background. And what do you expect? This guy started wrestling a couple of years ago at some strip mall gym next to a KFC in Bahrain. And it was evident upon his first time shooting a takedown. I mean, DC was saying he looked like a total noob out there and how unnatural he looked, level changing. So, you know, let me just give an apology to the weasel. I've clowned people like the weasel and wannabe hardcore fans picking these Dagestani guys or these Russians falling into the trap, and I fell into the trap today. So the joke's on me this time. Um, I have picked against these guys in the past. You guys know I picked against Amir when he fought Dawson. I was picking against fucking, you know, what's his name? I forget, Abu Smagomedov. You know what? People are saying that Shamil Gaziev is like Abu Smagomedov because he has no gas tank. But I think that that is a cop-out. I think that if you're saying that Shamil Gaziev just gassed out and, oh, he's just a fat heavyweight that gasses out, no, you got to hold him more accountable than that. All right? Shamil Gaziev had a lot more to give. He was gassed. He was tired, but not as gassed as you guys think. It's not that he could have won if he had put more pressure on, on Rosenstrike. I think he would have lost. I overhyped him. To be honest, like, first of all, I wasn't hyping this guy up. So don't try to act like I've been hyping him up like that, all right? When I say sorry to the weasel, I'm just saying the joke's on me tonight. You know what happens to us all every once in a while. But for me, it's once in a blue moon. And, you know, these guys back in the day with Garam Kudzeledzi, I mean, they were doing tricks on Garam. They were doing tricks on Demir's Magulov. I just said Gazia beats Rosenstrike because Rosenstrike tries to density max his way through takedown defense. And in this fight, the density maxing worked because Shmuel Gaziev had the takedowns of a volleyball player. So, listen. It's not just his gas tank. If you want to hold him accountable, just say this. He didn't do anything and he fought... He didn't do shit. Like, this guy would, would go three to four minutes on end without throwing a single strike. Okay. Like, that's worse than gassing out. That's actually more pathetic. There were literally, like, three-minute moments where I was looking at Shamil Blob Gaziev with his mouthpiece bobbling around, getting jabbed up in the face, not doing anything, not shooting takedowns, not throwing any punches, not throwing low kicks. I mean, it's an MMA fight. You would think that he hasn't thrown a strike in five minutes. Maybe he's got some of his energy back, and you could throw a fucking kick. But it didn't work that way, you know? It's like, my goodness. It was so frustrating to watch. Dude, you, you need to shoot! You can't just... <laughs> you can't just menacingly grin. You can't just menacingly grin at him, dude. Shamil's trying to win this fight with a facial expression. You're not gonna win. 
What the heck is he doing? Go in there. Shoot a takedown. Kick. Throw a leg kick. Throw a leg kick. It was hardly a fight. I mean, Jarzinho had a heavy bag in front of him the whole time. And you know what? Credit to him because he made it work. And his jab was good enough to be able to keep Shamil Gaziev docile and respectful the entire time. He put him in his place, shut down any bit of confidence that Gaziev had after that first round. And I think that it was a good stoppage. Really good stoppage by the doctor. Shamil, as I said, in the second and third round, just really wasn't doing anything. So he was just going to go out there and take more of a beating in the fifth. We didn't need to see that. We knew that there was no way he was going to get it done. As I said, his confidence had completely waned. And I guess this is going to be a good lesson for him. If I'm Shamil Gaziev, I'm losing some weight. I'm getting in better shape. And I'm working on my head movement. As far as Jarzinho goes, credit to him. I'm happy to see this guy get a, a good win over a, a grappler. Okay? Or at least someone that has the aura of a grappler. That's a good look for him. Let's have him fight Derek Lewis. Completely different matchup, but I really want to see this matchup. I've been asking for it for a long time. The UFC, I mean, what other matchup are you going to make? All right? You can only run from Derek Lewis and Jar Jarzino Rosenstrike being matched up for so long. You have to make that fight. I have a fear that it would be a little bit boring like in Ganu and Lewis, but Rosenstrike is going to be a little bit higher output. He's going to be kicking the legs of Derek Lewis, and he'll make Derek Lewis swing on him. And we know Lewis is not going to shoot any takedowns. So, yeah. And I also don't think Derek Lewis is going to respect the power of Jarzinho as much as he respected Ngannou's power. Not that Jarzinho doesn't hit hard. He does. Which is why I want to see the fight. Because it could be a banger. But because it's like, he's still not Ngannou. So I think Lewis will actually go for it. I wanted to see that be made on UFC 300. It wasn't made on UFC 300. Maybe we could do it on International Fight Week to open up the main card. Maybe to cap off the prelims. That would be excellent. Let's make that fight happen. And now I'm going to get on to the other fights on this card. So let's get on to the co-main event. Vitor Petrino versus Tyson Pedro. I thought that this was a really decent look for Vitor Petrino. It was a step up in competition. Pedro's a little bit closer to the rankings and he did retire. So let me just say, have a, a great rest of your life, Tyson Pedro. Good luck in retirement, but let's get down to business. Petrino looked good in the first round and he stole the round with his power advantage, and I talked about his jab in my recap video, you don't expect such a massive light heavyweight, because honestly, he, he's enormous for the weight class. He looks like a bodybuilder. He's huge. You don't expect him to have such a fast, technical, non-telegraphed jab, and he was stinging Pedro bad in that first round. They were close on strikes, but I gave that round to Petrino because he had a few moments where he really snapped the head back of Pedro, and landed with some substance. And then in the second round, it was close. It was a little bit weird. Because Pedro started coming on strong. And despite Petrino getting the better of all of the exchanges in close range, in the pocket. Taking Pedro's shots. Taking them well. Not really having a look like he was getting stung by his power. I was a bit confused as to why he didn't really do anything in that round. I think he omitted a lot of opportunities. So that was a Pedro round, and then Petrino went out there. He fought like a bat out of hell in the third round. From the moment it started, he started swinging bombs on Pedro, landed a bunch of big shots, took him down, ragdolled him, got close to a submission, really put a stamp on who the better fighter was, and he gets the job done. And I'm really liking Vitor Petrino. I think that this guy has a lot of potential. He's 26 years old. Even though you look at him and you're just expecting him to throw big wing and punches, he does have a, a nasty jab and he's got a really good ability to grapple. And he can take anyone down because he's insanely strong. I'd like to see him fight someone like Anthony Smith. And let's get on to the next fight. Muhammad Makaya versus Perez. Honestly, Alex Perez and Muhammad Makaev looked like shit in this fight. I'm not going to lie. Both guys looked kind of bad. Perez was getting the better in the stand-up exchanges. We saw Muhammad Makayev shoot a bunch of failed takedowns, rack up control time here and there, and I'm not excited for Muhammad Makayev versus Alexander Pantoja. I thought that we were going to see Muhammad Makayev have a similar-looking performance, but then he was going to dominate the third, as he usually would. But it was a step up in competition. It was very close. Again, it was kind of difficult to score it, but 
it was just sloppy. And you know what? Yes, I, I know that there were some really good abilities uh, from Alex Perez to stuff the takedowns. But, I mean, what are we really going to go off of here? Oh, what an amazing performance from both guys just bumping into each other a bunch of times. And Perez stuffs a million takedowns. That That's good for him. But he didn't really land a whole lot on the feet. But he landed more than Makayev. Let's just say that. Makayev striking is atrocious. And I don't think he'll be a champion anytime soon. And if he plans to retire in his mid-20s, he's going to retire without the belt. Because, again, he's not getting the belt anytime soon. I think Pantoja, who is bigger than him who's way more of a savage than him, who's probably even harder to try to control up against the fence, would probably knock him out. And also, I'm just not that interested in seeing that fight because there's a good chance it could be exactly like this one and they could just be bumping into each other and failing grappling exchanges on each other. And I'd much rather watch Tatsudo Taida. I'd much rather watch Steven Ersig. I'd much rather watch Joshua Van. My main takeaway from this fight is that the top of the flyweight division is horrible. Okay, and not as far as skill goes, but entertainment wise, we see the same guys fight each other over and over and over again. Muhammad Mikhaev is going to have boring fights over and over and over again. Nobody's going to beat Pantoja because, listen, what's Muhammad Mikhaev going to do? Gra- out grapple him? Not going to happen. Maybe he gets KO'd, but the only time Pantoja's fun is when he's standing on the feet. I just think that the top of the flyweight division needs to take a break. Okay, maybe we need a tournament. But all the entertaining flyweights, all the flyweights with fun and interesting styles are outside of the rankings or at the very beginning of the top 10, like Tatsudo Taida. As I just said, Steven Ursic got an amazing KO tonight. I think Tatsudo is the better grappler, honestly. If I'm looking at the best grapplers that are coming up the ranks, I think Tatsudo is way better than Muhammad Mikhaev. Not only can he actually control people, but... He has great ground and pound. He has a better submission game, and he's even better on the feet. Muhammad Makayev striking is just so horrible. All right? Like, there's no method to his madness. He just flails around his arms until he can get a hold of someone, and he's not really able to do much with it. Listen, he's still only 23. He's still good, but I'm not going to act like there's a whole lot to take away from this fight. It was just a bunch of failing grappling exchanges, and Alex Perez was lending a couple of good body shots here and there, and that was kind of it. So it was a real stinky fight. And the flyweight division just isn't looking fun and interesting. And again, the title picture is just uh, kind of a dismal look right now, isn't it? Who are we supposed to get hyped for? What contender is going to make us inspired? Like, there's no one that's interesting. Let's just get rid of the top five and, and start it over, <laughs> okay? Let's just have Pentoja defend his belt against Ursig, against Tatsudo, against these other guys. He'd probably beat them, but hey, at least uh, we won't see a bunch of rematches, so... Yeah, and I know Makayev wouldn't be a rematch, but we're done with it, okay? Makayev, I don't think he's going to get a title shot off of that. And I don't want to see him fight for the belt, okay? It's going to be a horrible fight, most likely. Because I think that he'll do enough not to get KO'd, but he'll just fail a bunch of grappling exchanges. So on to the next one. Umar Nurmagomedov versus Bexat Almakan. I think that this was a good performance from Umar Nurmagomedov, and he impressed me in this fight because I thought that it was going to be even harder than it was, okay? I did my research on Bexat Almakan. I watched a lot of his fights, and he looks really solid, okay? He's well-rounded. He has good wrestling. He has great striking, and we saw it early on. Within the first 30 seconds of this fight, he dropped Umar Nurmagomedov, clipped him with a big overhand off of the side of Umar's head. Umar recovers. Gets a hold of his leg, takes Bexat down, gets in mount, beats the fuck out of him, and closes the round off really strong. The second round, Umar lands a nasty jab, ducks under Bexat right after he lands the jab, gets the takedown, holds him down for like 4 minutes and 30 seconds, beats the shit out of him, rinse and repeat in the third. I think that this is a good performance. If you look at Bexat Almakan as a total can, a nobody, then I understand why you would be disappointed in this. But I honestly think thought that Bexat was going to do better. Okay? And I'm not just going to see him land one big punch and say, fraud check, fraud check. There were some people in my chat that were saying that. Just because Umar got hit with one punch and his body was affected by that. And then for 14 minutes of the fight, he dominated. I think it was pretty solid from him. I did not see a crotch sniffer in this fight. Like, Umar was beating the shit out of this guy. 
at the end of the second round, I looked at Bexat's face and he was all bubbled up, all purple. I mean, I think that Umar landed like 150 total strikes, all in ground and pound. It was pretty solid. He had no issue with Bexat. He wasn't just hugging onto him. When he wasn't throwing ground and pound strikes, he was trying to get into a dominant position to look for a submission. He attempted a bunch of submissions. He got close a few times. I thought it was a high-paced grappling clinic. And if you're going to sit here and tell me that he's boring, I understand that this is not the most entertaining fight. But there are way worse, way more boring grapplers. And I just don't understand how you could say it's boring when someone is landing strikes on the ground, right? And I was saying that during my stream because there were some people in the chat that were shitting all over Umar Nurmagomedov. They were saying he's boring, he's a crotch sniffer. And I was watching the fight while they were commenting that. And he's like raining down elbows on Bexat, raining down like big hammer fists on his face nonstop for like three rounds straight. Does this make me believe that he's going to do this to Pyotr Jan? Does it make me believe that he's going to do this to Song Yudong? No, but... I think that Bexat Al-Makan is going to do really well in the UFC, and I think that this win is going to age well, and I still think that Umar is going to be a champion. Okay, like, why would I believe that he's not after this as well? What did Umar show that was embarrassing other than getting hit with one big punch? Yes, his striking may not be the best in the weight class, but at the same time, Bexat is a good striker. He's pretty fucking solid on the feet. I don't think that there was a bad look for Umar. I really don't. Yeah, he didn't get the finish. That's unfortunate, but there's a lot of fighters that haven't gotten finishes in every single one of their fights, and they end up being champion as well. It was dominant. You can't say it wasn't. Every single judge gave him at least one 10-8 round. Bexat is probably going to win his next few fights. He's probably going to dominate the lower levels in the UFC and eventually work his way up into the rankings. So you guys will see. This win is going to age well. What's next for Umar? Well, I think it's time for another bump up, and that is Jonathan Martinez, right? Umar, Jonathan Martinez in June or July. We don't have to wait till Abu Dhabi. Let's make it happen. If he gets past Jonathan Martinez, then that's another good look, and maybe he can get a top five opponent, okay? So yeah, let me know what you guys think of this performance. Again, I thought it was pretty decent. Like, his takedowns looked great. Bexat has good takedown defense. Bexat has amazing grappling. If you've watched his fights... You know what I'm talking about. Umar taking him down and mogging him for 14 minutes is by no means a bad look. It's not like he was not doing anything on the ground. You want to talk about boring grapplers? Bring up Sean Brady. Bring up Alexander Pantoja. Bring up guys that do nothing once they have the takedown. Bring up people like Mohamed Mikhaev. I mean, look at that. That's a style of grappler that I will agree is boring. I was having trouble staying awake while watching... Makayev's fight, but Umar's fight was pretty fun. I, I enjoyed it. Let's get on to the next one. Steve Ursig versus Matt Schnell. I picked Steve Ursig by KO, and he gets it done by KO, but the KO that he got was a lot nastier than the one that I predicted. I thought he was going to get it done with the right hand, and he was landing a lot of straight shots on the chin of Matt Schnell, and Matt Schnell was eating them. Matt Schnell was doing pretty well in the first round, but Ursig still won it. Second round, Ursic lands a nasty combination. He goes to the body with the right hand, follows up top with the left hook, flatlines Matt Schnell, one-shot KO. Beautiful from Steve Ursic. Now listen, Matt Schnell does have the worst chin in the UFC, so it's not the most impressive KO, but it's the best thing that you could do against Matt Schnell. It's all Steve Ursic could do against Matt Schnell if he's living up to the potential. So you know what? Really good win from Steve Ursic. He's growing on me as a fighter. I'm starting to like him a little bit more. He called out Brandon Moreno. I'd like to see that fight. I know that that seems like it's a big jump up and Moreno, no, no, Moreno's got to get another total fight. I know the UFC thinks that way, but he's coming off of two losses. We need fresh contenders. And I was going to say maybe Muhammad Makayev, but then I think that even though Makayev is worse than Steve Ursig, probably, he might win because he might just rack up control time. And like... I just don't want to see Makayev ruin contenders just by bumping into them over and over and over again. So let's get Steve Versick someone that's going to stand with him a little bit or, you know, maybe even a Brandon Roy Val. Let's just give him a bump up. Fuck it. Manel Cap. Maybe Brandon Roy Val's too high up there right now. He shouldn't fight down that much. Let's give him Manel Cap. Maybe Tatsudo Taida. No, 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 no. We need new contenders. Do not cancel any of them out. 
The flyweight division is the one division where I don't really want these young guys to fight each other yet. Usually I would love that. Usually I would love the Bo Nickel versus the Joe Pfeiffer style of matchup, the Hernandez Kopilovs, but at flyweight, we need new guys. Maybe Alex Perez, right? I could I could see that one. I could enjoy that. Good win from Steve Ersig. And let's get on to the prelims. Anders beats Pickett. Decent performance. I think Jamie Pickett retired, so good luck in retirement. I did pick Anders to get this one done. Vinicius Oliveira versus Sopai. Now, I didn't predict this fight because Vinicius Oliveira's opponent pulled out, and by the time I made my prediction video, I thought he was off the card. I was going to predict it, but he didn't have an opponent until a couple of days ago. So Pai filled in, and he was dominating Oliveira. Vinicius Oliveira, who was getting a lot of hype coming into the UFC, he had been finishing people, he had a flashy style, bit of a showman. We saw that in this fight, of course. So Pai was dominating him, taking him down left and right, beating the shit out of him. I mean, he was like 10-8-ing Oliveira in the first. He was almost 10-8-ing Oliveira in the second. And then Oliveira gets up from the ground after getting his ass kicked, and he starts beating the shit out of Sopai. He flips the script. I don't even know how to score the second round. They both had like a 10-8 style of ground-and-pound moment. And then the third round hits, and Sopai is gassed. And he took this fight on a couple of days' notice. Oliveira's had a whole training camp to get ready for this date. Oliveira starts beating his ass. So Pai isn't really fighting back that much. He gets clipped with a good shot. There's like 20 seconds left on the clock. Oliveira's just been whooping him up badly. Oliveira charges at him and hits him with the coolest flying knee I've seen in years. Honestly, it's probably the coolest KO I've seen since, I don't even know if I can name one that was cooler than this. The Bon Fim, Terrence McKenney KO was cool, but that wasn't even as dope because Oliveira literally ran across the octagon for this flying knee, landed it perfectly flush, and it freaked me out. I'll show you guys my reaction right now. Nice low kick. Oh, he's rocked! Oh! Oh my gosh! What the fuck? What the fuck? Oh my goodness! Dude, that was fucking crazy. So, incredible finish for Vinicius Oliveira. Wasn't the best performance overall. I honestly thought that Sopai showed a really good version of himself. And because he took this on short notice, that makes it even that more that makes it even that much more impressive for him. But he just got a KO and that's a devastating one and that's probably gonna affect his chin moving forward so he needs some time off but honestly I think that that guy could be pretty decent in the future too it's a shame that he gassed out because he really was dominating the fight and maybe he would have beat Oliveira with a full training camp and as for Vinicius Oliveira he's got to work on his takedown defense he's got to work on his ground game because he looked horrible early on in this fight if he can improve on that then he's going to be fun to watch. Because if he can keep his fight standing, then he's going to give us wars. He's going to give us highlight reels. And that's what he did tonight. He gave us a highlight reel worthy KO. So awesome performance from Vinicius Oliveira. On to the Basra brothers. Eamon Zahabi beats Javid Basra. Now I did pick Javid Basra to get this one done. So I did get my pick wrong. But I've been saying this about the Bostrop Bros for a long time. They are not that good. They're overrated. And they're only continuing to win, win, and win because they're facing the same exact levels of competition every single time. And they're not even putting on statements. They're just like stinking it up to decision. And they're also not dangerous at all. Like, they have gra grappling, they have controllability, and on the feet, nothing but a bunch of pitter-pat nonsense. And Eamon Zahabi gets it done, defeating Javid Basharat, fraud checking him. Because I've been saying for the longest time, they're going to keep winning against these like mid-tier level guys as soon as they get up near the rankings and they actually start fighting people that are dangerous. They're going to get their asses kicked because they have absolutely nothing going on for them on the feet. And that's why Zahabi won this fight. The second round... Zahabi was winning. He started to get more confident. And I think it's honestly because Javid Basharat has no power in his hands. He has nothing to get his respect on the feet. And he's out there 
sticking behind a teep to the body, and that's kind of it. When you put pressure on him, he doesn't throw back. He doesn't have anything to sting you back with, like a, a snapback counter. And Zahabi just kind of mowed him down in the third, going crazy on him, like just swinging wild and getting in Bashrat's face. And he landed everything, landed everything that he was throwing. And I was so hyped watching it because I was like, damn, like this is how you take it to the Bashrat bros. And he gets the job done. I was a little bit surprised that Javid Bashrat wasn't shooting any takedowns because normally I would expect that. Maybe he had a lot of respect for Zahabi's grappling, but I don't know why that would be the case. I understand that Faraz Zahabi, his brother, Eamon Zahabi's brother, is like, you know, a big time MMA coach and he coached GSP and maybe Eamon Zahabi does have a good grappling base, but I would think that Bashrat would have shot more takedowns. But on the feet, these guys just don't have anything. There's just nothing there. It looks like they're Muhammad Mikhaev with a little bit more precision, but, you know, less quick twitch, less danger, less wildness. And I'm happy that Eamon Zahabi got it done because I was saying in that fight, dude, if Eamon just starts moving forward, every time he does that, he lands his shots. He doesn't have to respect the power of Bostrot. Just bite down on the mouthpiece, get going. His corner was telling him that too, which was really good advice, and he actually made it happen. On to the next one. Christian Leroy Duncan versus Claudio Ribeiro. Duncan destroyed Claudio Ribeiro, honestly. I mean, I mean, let me just say this. Claudio Ribeiro looks like he started training in MMA six months ago. He looks like a good athlete, but the way that he throws punches, I, I don't know who's teaching him how to throw these. And he's in there, like, shelling up, moving forward, but he's not doing anything. There's nothing that he does to get any respect. And we saw Christian Leroy Duncan dance around him, beat the shit out of him in the first round. In the second round, he went for a takedown. And I was saying to my chat, like, what's he doing? This is really weird. He was dominating so much on the feet. But as soon as he gets the takedown, he mounts Claudio Ribeiro within like 10 seconds and then TKOs him in full mount. So excellent victory for Christian Leroy Duncan. He blew Ribeiro out of the water. And I think that that's the last time that we'll see Ribeiro in the UFC. I just don't know how you're going to show up to a fight looking like that. I mean, I don't understand what Ribeiro is doing in there and how long this guy's been training, but I really wouldn't be surprised if it was only for a year because he just looks so sloppy out there. Uh, Christian Leroy Duncan gets it done easily. I'm becoming a fan of this guy. He has a really fun style. And let's get on to the next one. Ludovic Klein and AJ Cunningham. Shout out to AJ Cunningham for making this really entertaining. All right, some guys would go in there in their debut against a tough opponent and they'll just try to survive. Cunningham, from the moment the fight started, was trying to knock out Ludovic Klein. Ludovic Klein gritted down and just went berserk on Cunningham. He started landing combinations at will, was landing a bunch of good body shots, had really good boxing, and he knocks out AJ Cunningham in the first round. And the one thing I have to say about Ludovic Klein is, I'm sorry, because I was calling this guy an NPC. He does a whole bunch of nothing. And when he came into the UFC, to be fair, that was kind of the case. Like, he went to a split decision with Jai Herbert, or actually even worse, he went to a draw with Jai Herbert. He had a very boring fight with Mason Jones, Devontae Smith, and for his last two outings, he's looked pretty good. And I was saying he only beat Ignacio Bahamondes because Ignacio forgot that he had legs and he wasn't throwing any kicks, but he actually looked pretty solid in this fight. I know it was a short notice replacement opponent, but it is what it is. He still looked good, and he was really entertaining, so... Ludovic Klein is improving. And then the first fight, Loic Radzibov versus Abdul Karim El Sawadi. I did pick Abdul Karim. He did not look as good as he looked on the Contender Series when he fought George Hardwick. And a lot of people are saying, how bad is George Hardwick really? I honestly think that Sedway just looked really different. I don't think he was on point. Um, he didn't have his timing down. He just looked really anxious. And he looked like he was chasing a finish. And uh, I think that he gassed out a little bit, or didn't gas out, but he was just overextending on his shots. He made a bunch of mistakes, and uh, the sauced up Radzibov knocks him out in the second round. Radzibov is terrible. He's so slow. <laughs> he's just, he, he looks like he's 60 years old, but he's only 33. I know the guy's on some sauce. Um, he's all back. <laughs> That's basically it. That's like, the guy has big, meaty arm punches, and. I just don't understand what's uh, what's so good about this guy. But it's kind of pathetic if I'm Abdul Karim Al-Sawadi losing to 
Loic Radzibov, who is a slow poke. It's a real bad look. But that was not the Kanim El Sawadi that showed up to fight George Hardwick that exposed the hyped up British prospect. That was not the slick Sawadi putting the pace on him. Sawadi was doing well. He lost the first round dominantly. He was doing really well in the second. He won the second round. Right? He started to take down Radzibov at will. He was landing some good jabs and then in the third just overextends, gets caught by a big shot and gets finished. Really rough for El Sawadi. I was looking forward to this debut. And he gets knocked out. So that's unfortunate. Anyway, that was it for the card. As far as picks go, I went 6-3. and three. Not that great. Again, a couple of the fights were put together at the last second. And that's why they were not in my prediction video that I uploaded six days ago. But 6-3, and three, not that great. I got the main event wrong. Decent fight night. I thought it was pretty fun. I had myself a good laugh during the main event. Watching Shamil Gaziev slug himself across the octagon. Anyway, until next time.